Okay, it's going to be time for questions um, in just a moment. Now, who was that standing at the microphone who wanted to share something with us? What's your name? My name is Lamont. Lamont? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Look into the eyes of my frail grandmother. See, I wouldn't trade her for no other. And she whispers to me, they gonna kill me. Cause white folks believe in me. Just like they did King, made black folks fear his dream. Just like they did Malcolm X, and now this black man wants to be next. So don't vote for him, or you'll be condemning him to die. We both stood there with tears in our eyes for different reasons, for different things that we both believe in. And now in 2008, she want to take that away from me, from a country that wants change, from a black man that wants to prove that we are kings. But she wants to silence everyone. Because now she had flashbacks of the first time she seen a black man home, and she wanted to run, but her eyes were closed. So she surrendered her hope. And then the 60s came, and she got it back. The best time to be black until Martin Malcolm was shot. Then again, she had to hold her fears back. Now Obama wants to stand. He wants to be president. And all she can think about is another black man being hung again. But we can't give up hope. Part of King's legacy is for your white man. All right, give him a big round of applause. Wow. That was deep. Wow. That was deep. Wow. That was deep. How you doing? That was deep. But, uh, yeah, we're ready for our questions now. Yes, okay. Kev, that was deep. Well, before we, before we go into questions, uh, I'd like to just frame um, a few questions. Uh, Miss Natasha Eubanks uh, talked about blogging. Do we have any bloggers in the audience? Ah, not a lot of bloggers. Do you read the blogs? Do you keep up with the blogs? Do you like the, the fact that there is a new way of communicating and learning information on the internet? Are you using the internet? All right, uh, 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 Natasha, how'd you get started with this blogging stuff? Hold on one second. Um, basically, can y'all hear me? Speaking to No. Yes, yeah, not on one. No. Is it on? Right right Hello? There you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, basically, I got started because what I was doing at the time, I was in law school. I was not feeling what was going on. Um, Katrina came, wiped everything away, changed our lives. We moved to Houston, moved back, and I was just in the midst of everything. The only thing that kept me sane was posting on my site because a lot of people wanted to find out what's going on in Black Hollywood. They actually cared that I was even there. No one else was doing it at the time, and I don't think people realize the bigger impact it has than just this is celebrity gossip. And the way my whole point of doing it was um, I wanted to change the way media perceived us as a black culture. Anytime you ever saw black people on TV was strictly, you know, I love New York or some chick shaking a behind on a video and, you know, it was just all 99% negative. So why not do it ourselves and why don't we put out there something that all you see is us on the red carpet at the Emmys, at the Oscars, you see us at the, you know, fashion week, you see us, you know, even people break up, make up, all that stuff, but for our culture because that boils down in the long run so that the young people can see, um, what they can aspire to, more than just being a football player, more than just being a rapper. You know, there's so much more you can do. Um, so that's why I did it, and I just started because I just saw other sites doing it um, that were mainstream. They were not focusing on black Hollywood in any way, shape, or form. So I basically took their model, flipped it, made it my own, and focused on black Hollywood. 
Um, and it's very easy. You know, I started off with free software, taught myself everything. I'm not a web genius, trust me. That's why I go through so much drama now. I have to hire technicians. And, um, but, you know, it, you just have to be self-motivated, I guess, have a reason to start it. Um, go, find the, go research it. Go find the free software to start off with, and it's just built up from there. I like a little gossip. How rich is Jay-Z? <laughs> <laughs> Jay-Z is pretty rich. He's actually, I think, number three on the Forbes list this year. Number three um, on the Forbes list? On the Forbes list, right, for entertainment. Oh, really? All right. Um, and his, the main thing was his, um, I mean, you know, selling his Rockaware company for about $200 million, and he cut a lot of deals with Live Nation, and, um, you know, he, he endorses a lot of things, puts his name on a lot of things, the 4040 clubs, things like that, all racks up money. So he's a lot richer than Beyonce? No. Well, oh. yes, yes, for right now, for right now. Oh, is that right, Lowe's? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. for right now. She know, be, be, Beyonce know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, she was like, she wasn't even in the top ten, I don't think. Talam, I remember something about you from the time you were here. You're a family man. Uh, um, oh. <laughs> I have three children, but I'm not married. Where did it come from? Where did the children come from? How much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well tell us, how do you relate to your children? I mean, how, do, how, um, do you, how are you a father to your children? My daughters live in Atlanta. Um, my son lives in LA, which is why I'm out there often. Okay. Um, I actually feel, it's funny you would mention that because it's, I have a, a regret, I have some regrets about the situation as a matter of fact because my father's situation with me was that he would always be willing to spend time with me, but he wasn't ever trying to pay child support. You know, so he was never trying to provide financing. And, and my mother, you know how, how mothers are, they don't tell you that, you know. They just wanted me, she wanted me to love him on, you know, his terms, whatever. She wasn't gonna be like, you know what, he don't give you any money. So by the time I found out about that, you know, I kind of excommunicated him. I just, I couldn't believe that dude wasn't supporting my mother when I was a child. But my regret is, the, is that my situation is kind of the opposite because I provide the financial support for my kids, but I don't get to see them like I would like to because you know they're in Atlanta and LA and I'm here on the East Coast. But my relationship with them is that I talk to them uh, frequently on the phone and I see them in the summers and so on and so forth. But I, I guess it's one of those messed up modern <laughs> family type situations. I get along with their mothers. And like I said, I talked to them, but I would really like to see them more. Is there a lesson in anything that you have learned about this kind of um, situation where you do have kids and you, they're in different locations? And um, is there any lesson in any of this? I, I don't want to seem idealistic. I mean, I, obviously, I wish that I had only got married once. I wish I waited, actually. <laughs> you know, I got married when I was like 24, and I thought that was, because I came, you know, where I came from, people were getting married in high school. You know what I mean? So I thought 24 was a long time to wait. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I didn't want to have kids when I was 30 and 35. I'm like, you know, they're going to be too old. You know, I'm going to be too old to play with them. You know what I mean? I didn't think when you were 20 and when you're 19, you don't think like that. If I could have done it all over again, I would have waited till I was about 30 to get married. Okay. You know? okay. I mean, I think that was the major So that may be a little lesson. Don't rush. Yeah. And to marriage at a very early age. And the other thing was I only knew the lady for three weeks, so. <laughs> she hooked you. Lois. <laughs> Lois. It, it ain't just her fault, but I'm just saying. If I had given it more time and been more discerning and gave it a few years, I think I would have. She hooked you, man. She hooked you. <laughs> she hooked you. I think there's a lesson in this. <laughs> Los, when you first started talking to us today, you started talking about how people have certain um, preconceived notions about who others are, who come from certain places, mm -hmm. who, um, who live under, in certain environments. What did you mean by that? It's just like, you know, they see you with a, they see you with a fitted cap on. And a what? A fitted cap, like a baseball cap? A fitted cap. Fitted cap? Like a Yankee cap? <laughs> fitted cap. Fit it. Fit it. Fit it. Oh. Fit it. Okay. All right. Fit, fit it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> a fitted cat. Yes. <laughs> you know, and they, they basically they basically judge you by by what they see, and they don't know like especially especially my way they don't know it get deep. 
it can get real deep, you know? But life, I mean, I don't go around, like I, I won't even say anything about music or anything unless, unless I'm asked. I don't even, you know, I, that's not like the topic of my conversation. I'd rather talk about what's relevant, you know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, people don't expect, they don't expect this. They don't expect for all this to come out me, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes I don't. <laughs> so we're both surprised, I guess. Does your music re reflect your thinking? Yes, in a, lot of, in a lot of different ways. In a lot of different ways it does. Because so many things occur, so many things happen. It's actually, it's actually weird that um, you go through so many things and sometimes you think it's a setback. But if, I mean, if you gain something from it, if you learn from it, and you know, some people might call it a mistake, but if you learn from it and you actually gain and got further and more knowledge, how could it possibly be a mistake? It was necessary. So when I look at it in my life and I look at different situations, I'm glad that I went through the things I went through. I'm glad I go through the things I go through because who would I be? What would my story be? Who could I relate to? Who could I teach? You know what I'm saying? Who could I show that you can make it from there had I not? Would I even be here? You know what I'm saying? So I appreciate everything I went through. It got me where I am now. So All right. definitely comes out through my music. Round of applause for our panelists. Okay, time for questions. Uh, if you would uh, direct your question to the person you would like to answer it, go Well, ahead. I'd like to direct it to you. Oh. I wouldn't have came here today because we lost the great Honorable Stephanie Tubbs Jones. Oh. And after working for Congressman Stokes 16 years as his entertainment chairman, coming to your workshops all these years and losing my congresswoman, I didn't want to come today. But she was into hip hop and you helped influence her with get out the vote. We had Governor Strickland talk about he wanted the hip hop vote. So you made a lot of changes. I want to say we love you and on the behalf of the state of Ohio and the DJs Association and the hip hop community in the state of Ohio, I say th thank you. And you're our queen mother of hip hop and politics. Let's give a round of applause, y'all. I'm Silver B from the state of Ohio. Thank you. You're absolutely correct. We lost Stephanie Tubbs Jones, Congresswoman. Uh, it was a shock. Uh, it was so unexpected. And she had emerged in the Congress as one of the profound leaders, serving on the Ways and Means Committee, serving on the uh, Ethics Committee, and uh, as you know, traveling all over the country. Uh, a brilliant woman who had served uh, as a judge and a prosecutor uh, in Cleveland, and we're going to miss her greatly uh, in her absence. Let's give Stephanie Tubbs Jones a big round of applause. Let's applaud her for who she was. So, you know, oftentimes when we have some of our more mature, uh, mature people come, they come out of curiosity, or they come because they really have something on their minds that they'd like to say. And sometimes they leave without saying it. And in this open forum that we have, we are, uh, of course, uh, big enough, strong enough to take criticism, uh, to take advice. And so anybody with any criticism or advice, just go up to the microphone and tell us what you think, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, hip hop. Hi, my name is uh, Walter, uh, Dr. Walter McMillan from this starting this year. I, um, I'm from Los Angeles, California. Um, I have a statement and a question for Los. Um, Los. Los, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, you really hit home with uh, some of the things you were saying, um, particularly uh, with some of the things that you've gone through as a kid but throughout your life period making you who you are today exactly and you appreciating that right um myself i grew up in south central la wow got you know some pretty big trouble as a kid 16 years old found myself in juvenile hall central juvenile hall and um ended up doing about almost four years of my life in the youth authority there and it was huge for me because, you know, I grew up with in most of my life without both of my parents, you know. So mm -hmm. I went through a lot, you know, as a kid. But, you know, people ask me today, you know, who inspire you? Was there one person or, you know, 
or how did I get to where I am today? And uh, you know, I tell everyone that I wouldn't change any of it, right. anything that I've gone through, right. because it really molded and shaped my character to who I am today, and I really appreciate it, just based on touching on what you said as well, being able to communicate uh, with people on many different levels. You know, I can go to the hood and talk to some of, some of the homies I grew up with, or go to a boardroom uh, where I serve on the board of a nonprofit and speak with, you know, we have judges and you know, lawyers and people on the board and stuff like that, or my colleagues that I work with and go to school with and all that. So it really did uh, uh, mold and shape me to, you know, where I am today. So I really appreciate it. But uh, my question, right. um, you know, I struggled with, uh, you know, when you look at hip, I listen to hip hop all, I could listen to it all day, every day, you know, which is mostly, you know, I, that's all I mainly Excuse listen to. Excuse me one to. moment. Mm -hmm. Are you a radiologist? Yeah. Say that well, again. I'm my residency. He's a radiologist. He listens to hip hop every day. Did you hear that? Oh, uh, trust me. Uh, Trust me, they all do. <laughs> I know. Be surprised. I know, but yeah. this is the story that never really gets told. Right. Because people think that it's only young folks with their pants down below the below, with the caps turned backwards, with the new kind of language, we're all listening to hip hop. But I have been with lawyers and doctors and professionals who yeah. really do relax with hip hop. Yeah. So I just wanted to tell them you are a radiologist. Yeah who listens to hip hop, is that right? right you're right. Why well, do you listen to hip hop? Trust me, uh, why do I listen to yeah, hip hop? Yeah, why do you That's listen? That's what I grew up on. That's all I knew, <laughs> you know, growing up. And it actually, music in general actually really played a huge part, I believe, in where I am today as well. And well, mainly opening up my mind and, and allowing me to actually be open to other things that I would not normally have re been able to relate to. Um, when I was in Central Juvenile Hall, I was involved in a theater program. And one of, um, well, the instructor, a guy named Eric McGinnis, who, who was the head of the program, um, he, I remember he came in one day with, um, he wanted to use a Celine Dion song on, uh, w with one of the scenes. And I remember the first time we heard it, I mean, pre prior to that, I mean, all I listened to ever was hip hop, you know. And so, he played this song, and we're like, man, man, I don't know about this. You know, we were all like, nah, we, I don't think so, man, I don't think so. But then it was weird because about two weeks later, you know, we'd go into rehearsal, and we're like, hey, man, hey, where that Celine Dion CD at? Where that, yeah. So, that, yeah, it really opened us up to, like, and after that, I began to listen to more, um, you know, different genres of music and so forth. So, right. but, yeah, you'd be surprised when... Uh, yeah, you know, I have one of our instructors, a guy named Dr. Cohen, old Jewish guy. Um, you know how hip he is. You know, I mean, come, oh man, those are the new T Max you got. On? You know, I'm like, what you know about some T Max? You know, or you know, uh, ring phone ring and it's that Nelly um, song he did with Tim McGraw, that uh, country song. You know. Right, hip hop it's, is the most influential. Culture yeah, so in existence. So yeah, they are. It's yeah. A, you'd be surprised. I mean, yes. haven't listened to it. Well, that's but what we're we're trying to get people to know the great influence it is. That's why we cannot divorce ourselves, separate ourselves, or alienate young people because they have tremendous influence mm -hmm. and tremendous power. And that power and that influence is going to decide. Uh, a lot of public policy for the future, so we may as well understand it and try to be engage, engaging so that um, we can have a meeting of the minds. Exactly. Uh, my, okay? my, my question is, because um, I, you know, I struggle with this a lot, you know, you look at the hip hop culture, mm -hmm. and part of that, uh, now, it, it's become very, uh, a huge part of it has become very materialistic, I would say, focused on material things. Right. And when I go to a family function or something, and I see, you know, one of my cousins or something, you know, 15, 14, 15 years old, um, talking about, yeah, you know, I, you know man, I want to get that Escalade. I want to get that new 7 Series BMW or... You know, 
and they're really convinced and really serious about this. Like, it's not like, oh, I want to have it later on in life, or I wish I could. They're like, oh, man, I got to have one of those. I got to have one, you know? And my question would be is, what do you feel that hip hop can do to, in many ways, I mean, to them, it's reality, though. And that's why they really believe it, because they, they look on TV and they see Lil Wayne or right. Lil Bow Wow driving a Marcelago Lamborghini, you know, right. $300,000 car, you know, or they see... Excuse me, one moment. Mm -hmm. A great artist just walked in the room. I've been here a long oh. time. Sorry. I've been here all the time. Were you here all the time? I didn't know that. How many ever heard of Martha and the Vandellas? Okay, all right, okay, all well, right. Well, in, 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 sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, in, yeah. in response to what you were saying, the, the reason I think, well. No, my thing is what do you think hip hop can, or the hip hop community can do, or the artists can do to bring it to these kids that, I mean, because I know those things sells, that, yeah. that's what sells, but at the same time, what can hip hop do to um, let these kids know that that's not really reality, like yeah. You know? Well, well. In in all actuality, it's a different day and time now, and it actually is part of our reality now. Mm -hmm. You can be 15, 16 with an Escalade now, and you don't have to go about the uh, negative or, or or the wrong means of of, of obtaining these things now. You mm -hmm. got Soldier Boy, right? Mm -hmm. A lot a lot of people talk bad about this kid, right? Understand this. I studied him. Yeah, I studied mm -hmm. him. You know why? Because he was 16. Well, let's go back. He was 15 when he first started posting things on the internet. He was doing this himself with his home video. Mm -hmm. The same way she said she took free software and created what she created, he created what he did from something that was totally free, right? An online streaming thing, YouTube. He got recognized from YouTube. Through that, the person that recognized him gave him a record deal. By the time he was 16, he had the number one single in the country, mm -hmm. Superman. You, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody <laughs> familiar with this, right? Mm -hmm. The most popular dance probably in teen history since mm -hmm. Criss Cross had Jump Jump, mm -hmm. right? He, he went on, he's 17 now. He went on to get his own shoe. And understand this, not by Nike, not by Adidas, not by Converse, not by Puma, not by anything. It's his shoe. Mm -hmm. He has his own shoe. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like Jay-Z had, you know, he did Reebok. No, he has his own shoe. <laughs> he manufactures his own shoe. Mm -hmm. Okay? I, I'm trying to stress this to you, right? <laughs> not only that, on YouTube, he gets 15 cents per view and 10 cents per comment. For all you who don't, who don't know this. Right? So when people log on just to hate on him, he getting paid. <laughs> so check this out. Check this out. He has over 400 million YouTube views. Okay? 15 cents. Pay. Yeah, pay. Over, I can't even, you can't even, for every, for every um, video, he has thousands, thousands of comments. Mm -hmm. 10 cents. He's a marketing genius mm -hmm. at 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So the possibility of your nephews and your family members wanting Escalades and, 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 and Marshall Lagos, you know, when they're 15 and 16, is possible. Bow Wow got a Marshall Lago, a Phantom, a GT. Mm -hmm. He brought his mother a mansion. Mm -hmm. He take a shopping at Rick Rodeo. This boy just turned 21. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mario from Baltimore, same thing. Good friend of mine. It's possible now. So... What we have to do is we have to teach them that, yeah, it's possible, but it's not everything. Yeah, true. It's not everything. Mm -hmm. Martial Lagos ain't everything. Mm -hmm. Education is everything. Mm -hmm. Knowledge, mm -hmm. wisdom, and understanding is everything first. Because you can have all those things, like MC Hammer, and then lose them. I wanted to, I wanted to um, kind of add on to what he was saying. You were talking about how hip-hop is now, but I don't remember a time when hip-hop wasn't materialistic. You know, and even if you go back to Rapper's Delight, they was talking about driving in an OJ, and we'd be like, they got an OJ? You know what I mean? If you go back to Lottie Dottie, I mean, he dropped more brand names in Lottie Dottie than you ever even hear today. The originator you know I mean? of brand names. Yeah, I mean, Slick Rick, Slick I mean, he Rick. everything. And um, <laughs> I think it's really indicative of, of our culture. 
I think it's indicative of like just being the have-nots and always wanting more. And then we pay attention to what's flashy, what's fly, what's fabulous. And when Malcolm X and, and you know, when they, when they would go around and do speeches, I mean, he was keyed into it. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but they always wore Brooks Brothers suits because he felt like people were going to respond to that. They pulled up in limousines. I mean, they were the first people to have the whole entourage with like four limousines pulling up to the college just because Malcolm was going to speak. Right. You know, it's just, I don't know, fortunate or unfortunate. It's indicative of our culture. And for whatever reason, maybe it's because of, of where we've been placed on the social structure and what we aspire to. But we've responded to it and because we've responded to it people use that long story short we've been fresh you feel me <laughs> forever <laughs> we've been fresh we the originators of fresh when we had nothing we created fresh from nothing so they basically take what we create and they capitalize off of it now it's our turn to capitalize off of the things that we create we was rocking t-shirts with long johns underneath of them then you go on walmart now you got the long john built in a t-shirt <laughs> that came from us <laughs> We've been fresh. We still fresh. All right. Um, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Sumter James. I come from Florida. I'm a program director for a moderate risk um, juvenile facility down there. And my question um, is not really a question. I just want to ask um, Loss and um, Mr. Um, AC um, how some of these people that might want to hear some of your work, your artistry, how, how can they um, actually um, get in contact with that? Um, your rap that you did with the alphabet with letter A, I would really like to share that with some of the juveniles that's in, in my program. Yeah, I might come to Florida. I might come to Florida. Excuse me? I can come to Florida if you... Oh, we need, we need to hook up then, definitely. Yeah. But for those that's in attendance, can you please um, give us some information as, as to how we can obtain you know, oh, yeah. some things um, like that? And um, that was a nice, uh, keep your swag too, and uh, that was a nice rap, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. Swag <laughs> on a billion right now. <laughs> yeah, um, basically my... Um, <laughs> My, well, you can, uh, everybody got MySpace? MySpace? Come on, clap it up you got MySpace. You got MySpace? All right. So if I catch, never one of y'all don't send me a friend request, I'm gonna, I know where y'all be at. VA? Yeah, I know where y'all be at. All right, I'm going to come up there. Yeah, Richmond. That's what's up. Oh, yeah. Security? No, but um, on MySpace, um, if y'all got a pen or if y'all want to write this down, Y'all want to get that? I'm going to let y'all gather your, your things for a second. Yeah, okay. Um, get your um, electronic devices and you can, um, you can be. <laughs> okay. Um, www.myspace.com slash los, L-O-S, bad boy, B-A-D-B-O-Y. Los Bad Boy, L O S B A D B O I. On uh, I'm also I have uh, several things on YouTube. Um, everybody knows www.youtube.com. But then when you go to the search box, you can search my um, screen name for all my uh, stuff to pop up, which is Bad Boy E N T 23. B A D B O I E N T 23. No spaces. Or you can just Google me. <laughs> My, um, Lose Baltimore. I'm everywhere. Yeah, my, my website is talamacy.com, T-A-A-L-A-M-A-C-E-Y.com. I think I have enough flyers, actually, for everybody here, okay. um, but they went to get them. And um, in addition to that, so you can get to my MySpace, but it's myspace.com uh, backslash official Talam AC. But you can get everywhere from the website. And if you want the work, I have some CDs here. I would love to sign one for you um, if you have a mark or something, if anybody, you know will want one, or just order it on the web. Very good. Um, if you want to check out the YBF, which is my site, celebrity entertainment, fashion, everything up to the minute, it's theybf.com, T-H-E-Y-B as in boy, F as in Frank, dot com. And um, it's Young, Black, and Fabulous, and it's also on MySpace at myspace.com backslash YBF blog. I should be on that soon, so we will talk about it. <laughs> Yo, know, to take you back, I remember when uh, I'd like a chance to speak, so I can sit back down. If you don't, oh, mind. Oh, yes, <laughs> sure. Councilwoman from Detroit, Michigan, my <laughs> 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 
Greetings to the Honorable Maxine Waters. Thank you for letting me be a part of this uh, seminar and gathering here at the caucus. I came here for two purposes. I am on the Detroit City Council and been an elected official. We don't give anybody but two minutes to speak when we're at the, the committee. Hey, so, uh, you <laughs> I'm going to make mine brief. I'm going to I'm going to make mine an example and be very brief. Um, when um, I was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995, In an interview, I was asked, did I like rap? Did I like hip hop? And I said, no. I didn't like the profanity. And they didn't add to, I didn't like the profanity. They just said no. So I had to go on the radio and I had a conference call with a lot of rappers who said, how dare I start a, try to stop them from making money? Uh, this is an industry just like Motown Records. Uh, excuse me, son. OK. He's distracting. Uh, there's a, some teachers who sent out a list of bad words to their students and they're making apologies. Are you aware of that? No, I'm not. Okay, there was some teachers who gave a list of bad words to their students because they want to expose them to the world. I love the freedom of speech uh, of our Constitution. I love that. But I do think that you curse the whole world when you speak profanity and for no particular reason. So as an artist who made records, and I'm here also for AFTRA, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. I'm on the board of directors, and I'm right. with the branch in, in Michigan. And um, we need to get paid for our records when they play them on the radio. When I say records, sometimes kids look at me and say, 45s, all y'all had guns? <laughs> I said, no. I said, those are the little records that were like donuts had the little distant one in the middle that said uh, uh, that you put on the record player. I said, what's a record player? So it's a lot of education and background to music. It's not just that you can stand up and, and off the top of your head know the history. But I'm good to, it's good to know that we are being informed. Dad used to say, some of the students go to school, they read the lunch and eat the books. <laughs> you have to be real careful how you spend the money that you make in your record industry. There's a lot of uh, economics involved, and a lot of people getting rich. They even have diamonds in their teeth. But it's all about educating and giving back. And I love the fact that your panel was clean today, and that the information that we was given was on a, uh, a level, a human nature level. And we'll help each other if we keep working with one another. And uh, I would really like to see a censorship on profanity. I'd oh, like okay. That. All right. Let me tell you, I thank you for being here. You're one of the wonderful, talented performers of our time. Uh, the issue that you referred to about whether or not artists are getting paid is an issue before our Judiciary Committee. And um, I called Stevie Wonder, who happens to own a radio station and be an artist himself. And I said, okay, which side of this argument are you on? He said, I think everybody ought to be paid. There you go. Okay? So I think you're going to win on that argument. I thank you for being here. And I want you to know uh, that I really do believe you're one of the great artists of our time. And I want these young people to know uh, what you went through and how you were able to persevere and to become known and you have followers all over this country because sometimes the young people never get connected. And when they do, then they start to try and capture some of what you're doing. When you take a look at Queen Latifah uh, and many of these other artists, they're now going back grabbing some of that music. So give Martha a big round of applause. Okay, this gentleman's been standing over on this microphone and then we'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Talon, you, you said you were low, says what? Oh, word. So that's why the swag is on a billion. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll start you off on one of my, like, oh, yeah, okay, a normal day. Um, 
wake up around 6 when I went to bed at probably about 4. And I'll talk about that when I get there. So 6 o'clock, <laughs> 7 o'clock sometimes, wake up, get my stories together to do the Big Boy Morning Show. Right after that, about 8 o'clock, I'm um, starting to post on my site. I post every single hour. I work 100% alone. So um, everything I do is, everything you see is written there by me. So every hour I'm researching, I'm re- researching the Internet. I'm getting all the stories. I have sources all over the country. They email me nonstop. I get about 500 emails a day. I check every single one. I answer everything myself. Um, so whoever, whenever you hear stuff from me, people always get shocked. They're like, "Oh my God, is this really you?" Yes, it's me. Because I don't, I don't. I'm a control freak. I don't like people doing everything for me. So I try to do as much as I can myself. So I talk to my sources all day. I'm um, doing interviews with celebrities, talking to celebrities' managers, celebrities' publicists, getting info from them. Um, Posting away, uh, probably about 8 or 9 o'clock. I'm done with posting. That's when the business end starts. Since YBF is now a business, it's Young, Black, and Fabulous LLC. I also have an online magazine. Um, I'm talking about, I'm brokering, you know, my advertising deals while I'm washing my face. And, you know, it's like $10,000 advertising deals that I have to keep a straight mind to to get. Um, And that's only for a week. So it's a lot of stuff to keep during after nine or ten until like four in the morning I'm trying to get the business side together um, making sure the advertising dollars are there making sure my design looks good I have a designer that I um, outsource to making sure my server technicians have the site up and running 20 hundred percent of the time which is very difficult for a site of mine that has um, 12 million users per month um, so it's it's a non-stop all the time deal and it's definitely not glitz and glamour the closest thing to glitz and glamour I get at this point I don't even like going to parties I don't even like doing you know events because it's all work I'm there to yeah you get VIP yeah they're bringing you in yeah they'll fly you down and give you cars and limos but I'm there to work because my money comes first so I'm trying to get all the best information I can I have to talk to everybody I can to get the exclusives and so it's all work so it's definitely not 100% glitz and glamour in terms of um, business do you all understand um, the advertising that is necessary to make money with, uh, with these blogs? Do you get it? You, when she's talking about um, her ads, uh, $10,000 for right. per week, uh, you understand that's how the money is made? Um, a lot of people don't understand that really. Um, well, when I say advertising, I'm not talking about me advertising. I've never put a dime into advertising the site. Everything has been 100% word of mouth since day one. Um, or just people just logging on because they're nosy. They want to see what's going on in Black Hollywood, and that's great. Um, but other than that, I, I don't even put myself out there to say, hey, come advertise with me. I don't have to contact Bad Boy. Bad Boy contacts me every other day to run ads of their Bad Boy artists on my site. Um, every major record label contacts me at least once a week to run an ad on my site. I work with seven different ad agencies, and that's how a lot of people now, I don't know if you all know, but online is basically going to be the main form of media when it comes to print, like print magazines, print newspapers, all that's going to be out the door by 2010. Everything will be online. So now all these major labels, major movie studios, major everything, they're moving to online advertising almost almost exclusively in some terms. Um, so th- the money is outrageous. You will be surprised of how much they would advertise, like I said, $10,000 just to rock, just to put a skin on my site, just to put a picture and, on my site for a week. And tell um, them why they pay you that kind of money to advertise on your blog. The main, I know for mine particularly, it's a niche blog. Um, I reach a, a d- demographic that is the largest consumer base in this country, and that's 18 to 35 year old black women. Um, and I, if I have that right there at a one click, they can see, every, I mean, that's their demographic. They can get them in one click. They're much more willing to spend, you know, have a ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 budget where they're gonna guarantee breach that demographic as opposed to spending a million and with you know with I don't know advertising on a billboard where they might reach 10% of their demographic it just it's more it's more efficient for them to go to that demographic and go to them directly and pay them whatever they need to pay to get it done Um, and like I said I work with seven different ad agencies those ad agencies come in they broker my deals for me and they just take a small cut I get everything else so I run all different types of ads I keep everything as streamlined as possible so it's not overrun by ads like a lot of these sites are but if you're a big site and if you you know if you keep things up to date if you're if you're a good site people just like to go to it you're gonna make a good amount of money and it's you have to make it your business um, I don't I don't you know I don't let anybody take stakes in it I don't I don't 
portion off my money to other people. Um, everything I do is 100% mine. Nielsen, are you measuring uh, the blogs? <laughs> you do? Everyone uh, because, advertises uh, on blogs now. Obviously, this is uh, of growing importance. All right. Yes, 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 ma'am, young lady. You're next. Um, hi, my name is Mariah, and I'm a senior at Thomas Jefferson High School in Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Yeah. Um, my question is, being that you all are successful black people, how do you feel about the young black people and even the older black people who are saying that they're not going to vote for Obama because they feel that they don't want another Martin Luther King situation or another Malcolm X to happen? I, I think it's a, um, I mean, I think it's a cop out if, if, a, if somebody, uh, makes himself electable, if somebody runs uh, the race to become president, then he's already saying that he's willing to take the risk or, or whatever may come. So I think it's a cop out for somebody to say that they're not going to vote for him. He's already done that, you know what I mean? And there's nothing they can do to change it. And, and honestly, I don't, I don't foresee something like that happening. I mean, um, I, I don't know if I'm just too positive or just too optimistic about things, but I don't, I don't foresee anything like that happening. I think that people should vote their heart and vote their mind and not worry about what's going to come and just hope for the best. Okay. All right. Any other response to that? Uh, All right. Next. Um, good afternoon. My name is Kayla. I'm a junior at Thomas Jefferson High School. <laughs> What, what type of discrimination? Any type. Your do, so do people discriminate against me? Yeah, or your side or whatever. You oh, definitely. Um, like I just went through a whole hacker situation um, and they were targeting, it was a very formal, very sophisticated thing that was they outsourced to overseas in Japan and they were attacking urban or hip hop bloggers that had a large presence on the internet, things like that. And I have to pay a ridiculous amount of money per month to control that. Um, I even have Sensei, who's a web forensics team who deals with, they only deal with the CIA and you know certain private people. And they even said this is one of the most sophisticated things they've seen. So things like that, of course, there's people all over this world that don't want to see positive images of black, the black community. Or they're just jealous. They don't want to see you doing well. They want to put you down. Um, and when it comes to discrimination, against me and the whole business aspect, there's tons. There's ageism. Um, you get treated very, people, people are very quick to not give you respect because as soon as they find out my age and as soon as they find out that I, what I focus on, they don't take me seriously. And so they start to see the dollars that I can bring to them. Then they want to come back and give me even more money because they're like, oh, really? Oh, well, now we should maybe take you seriously. Well, yeah, you should have known that the first time. So, you know, now it, it's getting better. It definitely is getting better, but I go through, I do go through a lot of that. What do you do to keep going? It's it's a passion of mine. I can't I can't stop. There's too many people that love it. So I mean, if if too if I, I just feed off of people, you know, like if people love it, if people want to see it. Um, same thing with after Katrina, I was ready to stop everything. I even wrote a whole long blog post on my site. I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. I hate everything. I hate the world. Can't believe our government did this. And everybody's like, no, don't leave us. You know, like it's, it's, it's a necessity. If it's something that's needed, if I love it, I can't stop something I love just because somebody's trying to put me down. I don't care. Obviously, you're trying to put me down because you're scared of what I can do. Right. So I'm going to do it more. Um, and this, you know, you all, you all love the site. I mean, people want to read it, so why would I stop? All right. Yes, ma'am. You have a question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Welcome. It's an honor to stand before you and uh, the distinguished panel. My name is Teslin Figaro Turner, and I co host a political talk show in the great state of Florida, Congresswoman Brown's district. And my host of the show, and I won't bring his name up, you know him well, though. <laughs> From uh, California? <laughs> Yes, you know him well. Okay. Yeah. I won't bring his name. I won't throw him okay. under the bus. But okay. he constantly criticizes me because I quote hip-hop a lot. 
Um, I'm from the Generation X, real hip hop, you mm -hmm. know, so mm -hmm. I can quote Little Kim and Betty Wright, mm -hmm. but I also can quote the current bailout situation as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm also familiar with local politics. I'm also familiar with what our Congress is trying to pass. So my statement is, I would love to see our generation of hip-hop artists become more involved in the process. We could use those lyrics on the hill. That's where the real power is. And if we just continue to keep ourselves in a box, and I, I know hip-hop is powerful, but it's even more powerful to have someone like yourself actually being up for debate, you know, right now in Congress. So I encourage our generation, the hip hop generation, to use those words and verbs. And when you said my intelligence begins where your curriculum ends, we need that in our Congress. We need that in our state legislation. And we need that in the White House. That's why so I'm change here. is one thing. That's why but we also say pray and then move your feet. Right. So move those hip hop yeah. sneakers. It, it let's really is. make a difference regardless of what side you're on. Mm -hmm. And let's bring that intelligence uh, to what our country so much deserves. Yeah. Thank the, you. Wow. Music has, um, just to interject, just to elaborate for a second. Music has taken me everywhere in my life. I, nothing else has besides God. Music has taken me everywhere that I've been. All music. I was, in, I was actually in college. And I had the opportunity um. to travel and get a recording deal. I had a choice to make. A lot of people in my family hadn't went to school. When I was in the process of trying to go to school, I didn't know how I was going to get in school. We had no money. But I ended up going to school. But like I said, everything that happened in my life, I don't regret anything because it got me where I am now. So music took me everywhere. I recorded. I was in... Um, um, you from LA, right? I was in I was in Burbank, right? I recorded at Will Smith Will Smith Studio in Burbank for for like a month straight. I stayed on Hollywood Boulevard at the Roosevelt with Lindsay Lohan, Tay Diggs. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm 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 like that's Lindsay Lohan. She weighed like 39 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but like I'm really next to her. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm really sitting next to her. Um, I'm mingling and just doing different things. Like I'm, I'm, I was sitting by the pool and I'm, I'm talking to this, to this white guy and he like, we, we just talking. I'm like, yeah, I rap, rap. He like, yeah, I love rap, right? He said, um, I, I asked him, what do you do? He said he sells jets. I said, you sell jets? <laughs> Real jets? He said, I sell jets. He said, I want to introduce you to my, my, um, my buddy. So he introduced me to his buddy. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I cut diamonds. I said, okay, let me think. You sell jets, and you cut diamonds. I need to be your friends. <laughs> Where I'm from, they sell something else, and they cut something else. Oh, I want to talk about But basically, music has taken me all these places, and I have the opportunity every time, it never fails, to expose a different culture, a different genre, a different person, a different demographic to hip hop as we know it. And basically, I'm not gonna say that's just my gift, but that's one of my gifts. So as you were saying, I might just be at the next, you know what I'm saying, the next presidential debate, you know what I'm saying? And I'll be right there, and I'll be right here to say everything I'm going to say. Yeah, I would and love I don't to think, see you write something on I, the bailout. And I don't think McCain, fe I already did. You did? Yesterday. Okay. okay. Yesterday, I said I never told a lie. I never told a tale, I don't brag, I got $700 billion bailout swag. Real talk, right. because I'm in tune with everything that's going right. on. And it's important for the children to know. Yeah, and I don't, think McCain, I don't think McCain quick enough to keep up with me. <laughs> well, or Paulson, me, or Paulson, for that matter. Let me just tell you that um, the debate is going to be on tonight. Mm -hmm. Good. Please watch it. You're going to see McCain get his clock cleaned. <laughs> He tried to get out of it. He tried to have people believe that somehow he was needed in Washington for the bailout. He knows nothing about the economy, so he was not needed in the discussion about the bailout. And so it didn't work, and he's got to be there, and I'm stopping everything, and I will be glued before that TV set because I'm going to enjoy watching him uh, get taken out, okay? Ms. Waters. Yes. Do you know that if they were going to go through what they were proposing, 
that it would take the deficit up to 11.3 trillion. That's trillion. right. You're absolutely correct. Um, as you know, the uh, Republicans, the Republicans um, basically denigrated Democrats because they said we were tax and spend liberals. And uh, when we were in power, we worried so much about balancing the budget, and Bill Clinton did it. He balanced the budget and even had a surplus. And since Bush has been in power, he has created the largest deficit uh, that we have ever known, and it keeps going up. And adding to this would be $700 billion uh, in a bailout that uh, most people don't even uh, understand the connection between Wall Street and their daily lives. So it's one of the things that we've been spending hours on and will continue to spend a lot of hours on uh, because uh, the members of Congress um, need to have a lot of questions answered, need to have a lot of input, need to really understand what's happening on Wall Street with Fannie and Freddie, and need to understand the implications for credit, uh, not only uh, for home mortgages, but for every other aspect of our lives. So we're working on it. And even though they said they had to have the answer right away, uh, they're not getting an answer right away. Uh, we'll have to stay here and, and work on this until we make sense out of it. I, yes, ma'am. Oh, you want to say I, Yeah, I wanted to. I know you asked the question, like, what do we do every day? And I didn't answer it. And you saw me smile at you when they kept going because I didn't really want to answer it. I didn't <laughs> want to talk about what I do all day every day. But you, you kind of brought up one of the things that I did, I guess, and it gives you an example of the type of thing I do. And I do, you know, a lot of the, the, my own web design. I have, like, four databases, I, you know, all of that stuff. I have uh, Facebook, MySpace. I do my graphic design, my tour, you know, my, uh, my own, what do you call it, uh, people tour, whatever. The people who, who find flights or whatever. I, I do all of that oh, stuff. Yeah. You're on your own booking agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, and my own booking agent, my own manager, right? <laughs> right? But in, a, but in addition to that, one of the things that I do is try to understand what's going on in the world. And at 2, 3 o'clock this morning, that meant that I was up, um, first of all, listening to um, Clinton, to Bill Clinton, trying to figure out you know, what his take on, on that bailout is. And then they were talking about the deregulation. So I guess about 3 or 4 o'clock this morning, I started looking up the Glass-Steagall Act because mm -hmm. I was trying to remember what it was all mm -hmm. about. And the Glass-Steagall Act is the act you know, that when they first uh, set out the banking system, they said insurance companies, banks, and investment firms should all be separate businesses. But somewhere, I guess it was 99, somewhere around 99, uh, Senator mm -hmm. Graham had an mm -hmm. act that repealed the Glass-Steagall mm -hmm. Act. So what ends up happening is you have banks in the investment business, and they, and they argued for it because at the time, I think America had like 14,000 banks, and other countries only had like three, four, like, you know, Spain and Canada. I mean, you got Banco Santa, Santander in Spain, and you've got, you know, uh, uh, banks in Canada and, and you know, in, in Tokyo that are, they just have like a national bank. You know what I mean? So American banks felt like they weren't competing. So then you lost the SNLs, then they deregulated. But then you end up with a problem where uh, the same people who are taking in people's assets, you know, taking in your deposits, um, they already had the incentive to make loans because, you know, banks work the opposite of, of any other business. On a bank's balance sheet, a loan is an asset. Your deposits are their, are their liabilities. So they already have, uh, you know, they're already inclined to make loans whenever they can. But when you, when, when you repeal that act, what you end up having is you have the same people who are taking deposits also trying to, to, to create investment income as well. And when you have things like uh, collateralized mortgage options, when you have these securities that are collateralized by mortgages, then you, you find yourself in a situation where you have a conflict of interest. So I think that the problem isn't deregulation in and of itself. The problem is, is quite simply greed. You put the banks in a situation where they could take from the average citizen, and they, they just kept making loans and making loans to hide it, and eventually, like all houses of cards, it falls down. Exactly. Well, there's a lot to be learned about subprime and the fact that it's at the epicenter of the economic crisis that we have. He did allude to the uh, mortgage-backed securities, and they put them in tranches and put them up on uh, Wall Street. And um, even the rating agencies gave them triple A. And they created all of these exotic products that never should have been on the market. Uh, no documentation loans, uh, teaser rates that reset and quadruple the amount of the mortgage. And he's right. 
It's a house of cards that's all come crumbling down. And um, we've got to find a way, if there is to be a bailout, to save those homeowners who are at risk of foreclosure. And it can be done. All of these banks have what is known as loss mitigation departments, and they should be doing modifications and workouts on the loans. That is, taking one of these loans with an adjustable rate mortgage, stretching it out to a 30-year fixed, and refinancing. And we're working on that. I mean, this is what we're spending an awful lot of time on. Uh, and even while I'm here today, when you saw my chief of staff run up here uh, about an hour ago and show me a piece of paper, what he showed me was language that we had developed uh, that is still being negotiated and what they was asking me to settle on in terms of language that would go in uh, to help get these loan modifications. And I had to sign off on that language and run it back to the Senate uh, where they are again doing these negotiations and uh, coming up with what is going to be the shape and form of any bailout. We have to get that in there. We had to get in affirmative action language to make sure that all of our people of color in the securities industry, the black professionals, uh, don't get locked out of uh, these, the management of, of the assets that are going to be acquired. Uh, we had to protect our small banks and our minority banks, and so it's a lot of haggling going on. I am not yet online because they have not included bankruptcy in all of this, but what we have to do is be prepared in case this thing is going to move to make sure that we don't end up in a situation where uh, our asset managers, our lawyers, and our consultants, and our accountants, and all those people who play in the Wall Street markets and in this financial services industry don't get left out. And so that's really the fight that's going on behind the scenes right now. Yes, ma'am. Well, one thing is, um, well, first off, I always, I'm one of the only sites actually that does include social activism and what's going on in the world, what's going on in politics, what's going on with just anything, especially Gina Six. My dad was actually the lead attorney on the Gina Six case, so I always had up-to-date information. Um, I always include those things in my postings, um, unlike many other sites. However, I did start this site as a celebrity site, just because there's always going to be turmoil, turmoil across the world. There's always going to be a crisis in our country. There's always going to be something going on. That does not mean that we can't have additional types of media or other things that can be either escapism for people or just, you know, something just different for them to look at for just a few minutes out of the day. I don't think that hurts anybody. It actually could help morale. Um, if you're just completely submersed in all the horrible things going on and the recession and the economy and, you know, 24 hours a day, that gets monotonous and it gets depressing. So why not just look at what a celebrity is doing? Like, oh, look, Rihanna's at Fashion Week. Look what she's wearing. That's hot. It takes you five minutes and you feel a little bit better about your life and then you go back to your life. You know, why not? Um, clearly, it's, and it is also a sin business, quote unquote, and I'm not sure if you all know, but like sin businesses um, are, you know, gambling, um, alcohol, cigarettes, everything, those types of things always excel and always accelerate in times of crisis. Um, and that's, that's for a reason. People need some kind of form of escape. So. All right, we're going to wrap it up. This will be our last question that we have here. And um, Natasha, you mentioned that uh, you gossip and you blog about your celebrities and fashion and all of that stuff. And I noticed you had on some quite unusual <laughs> shoes. Before you leave, I want you to show them the shoes you have on, oh, okay? Officer. She wanted me to come down there with that. I feel like really embarrassed by that. <laughs> I don't know why. How many people can wear this fashion? Oh, gosh. It's just every day. It's not that crazy. <laughs> they're from oh. YSL. Yeah, they're cute. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. How many inches is that? <laughs> it's it's uh, five inches. You Actually, don't. five and a half. Right. I'm short. Though. I'm only five three, so I'm always trying to wear like five inch heels so I can, because you know people don't take me seriously. So I gotta, <laughs> Our last question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Waters. My name is Jolanda Jones. I'm a baby elected city council oh, member yeah. of Houston. You, you're Alicia. 
Tribute one. It's, what's your name? Jolanda Jones. Jo okay. Jolanda. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. I know your husband from Fifth Ward. I'm from Third Ward. That's but in right. Any He's case, Fifth Ward. In any yes. case, um, I just want to ask each of you if you've ever considered running for office um, and not just sitting on a, the pedestal. I know that I'm sort of different in Houston. I look different. Um, most politicians look the same way. And it's really hard to get people to understand you if you're not a decision maker. And we just went through Ike. In fact, we're still going through Ike. Yes. And it's very difficult. And it's like you said, uh, Natasha, that we need distraction. I'm, I, this is weird. I was on Survivor, so a bunch of my friends from Survivor, Amazing right. Race and Big Brother, are coming to Houston to raise money in October oh, cool. as a distraction and for Ike. But apart from that, um, it is very important, I think, for us to be elected, yeah. not just do forms, because people need to see who we are. And so I'm just wondering about your interests because politicians determine who gets aid, who gets money, who gets bailed out. So do any of you think of that? And after you finish doing what it is you do, right. would you consider doing that? That's so funny that you asked that. Actually, I was going to law school to be a lobbyist, and I actually wanted to also be a politician. I wanted to be in, I interned three times, three for three summers on the Hill, with um, both on the on the Senate side and on the House side. I am. I love politics as much as I love celebrity gossip. Love it. I've always wanted to be in politics, but more on the state level, um, because I think that a lot more things get done. It's two completely different fields, um, federal government and state government, two completely different things. But I love state government because of the activism. Local, local is a good thing, too. Oh, no, local, local as well. Local and state are definitely getting things done. Federal government is very difficult to get things done. It's huge bureaucracy. I love it, though. Like I said, I interned here three times, so I love it. But, um, you know, I, I always have aspirations to do so. My dad's actually running for judge right now in Louisiana, so it's all throughout the family. <laughs> okay. Um, Los, do you ever, you're interested? She's asking you. Um, I actually... Uh, I actually never was interested in being a politician. Um, it's just not. It's just not my. It's just not my thing. Um, I actually like what I do. I actually love what I do. And um, I think I'm. There's a lot of politics that goes into what I do, and in a lot of different ways, um, I can be persuasive. You know what I'm saying? I could. Um, I could help. Politics, like if you, you run for president or something, then right. I got your back. You know, thank you. I'm going to say vote, you know, <laughs> y, you. Y, you know, YBF. Yeah, thanks. Like that. And, you know, I, I want to be on the other side of it. I, I don't really want to be a politic, but um, I love public speaking and talking to the youth and, and helping guide them in the right direction. So, you know what I'm saying? I mean, politics, is, it's a, it's a woo. It's a beast. It's a tough <laughs> game. It might be. It might be a little bit iller than the rap industry. <laughs> yeah, politics a little, little, little rough. So, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna definitely tell the truth on that, it, on that aspect of it. But um, I like what I do. I love what I do, and uh, I couldn't ask for anything more. So, I just vote. <laughs> Everybody voting? Yes. And registering. All right. Thank you so very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Did you have a good time today? Did you enjoy your panel for today? Give them a big round of applause. Thank them for coming, and they may come back again. Thank you so very much. Thank you.